Hi everybody. Um, I just wanted to be brave and come on to a live today um, and take up Liz's invite to just explain what got me interested in politics. Um, I just want to thank Monica and Liz um, for last night's introduction um, and I'm looking forward to the program. <clears throat> so my name is Tiffany Judd and I'm a registered nurse in Queensland. Um, I was stood down because I had safety concerns about what the government were mandating everybody to have. Um, I spent the last 11 years uh, providing care, compassion and empathy to my community members. Um, and what got me interested in politics at the moment is just their lack of compassion um, for <coughs> our fellow community members, uh, not caring about how this is going to affect people's uh, well-being um, with people losing their jobs, incomes to provide for their family. Um, it was when I went to the Yapoon business meeting that um, I saw the stress and anxiety in our community members locally uh, and I wanted to do as much as I could to help support people through this time. Um, I started speaking up at some rallies, Rockhampton and Emerald, and uh, some business meetings in Airlie and Bowen. Um, if you're interested, I do have a YouTube channel, Tiffany Judd, where um, my speech about our current <clears throat> predicament at the moment, I've put up there in Bowen. Um, I also became an activator for RDA at the end of last year. Um, because I wanted to try to um, help make a difference in some way to help change what we've become now as a dictatorship. <clears throat> um, I've always felt blessed to live in this country um, and we certainly don't want that um, today. So I'm looking forward to learning more in, in the program um, and that's all. Thanks guys, bye. G'day guys, Lucas here. I thought I'd give this thing a go. Uh, what's changed in my political stance compared to last, uh, let's say last election? I was a Greens voter, but as we know the way they voted uh, for the pandemic bill, well they lost my vote. Uh, they used to stand for sticking it to the man and the glory days of Brian Brown and, and the like. So yeah, freedom parties first, so freedom has a voice and a seat or definitely more seats than one for sure. And so we can take back Australia and make it better than ever. Yeah, pretty much that. Well, good evening, everyone. It is day two of five, and I promise you today is going to need a little bit of uh, probably a notepad and pen, I would say, because it's quite heavy, but we need to learn these things. So I'm really excited to show you uh, the program that we have tonight. But before I do that, and I'm not going to waffle on much at all because most of you know me uh, and you at least know the last two years of my life, but I just want to quickly recap to you recap for you why I'm doing this. Why do I spend so much time uh, putting out information uh, on the streets and things like that? The answer is actually more simple than you might think. It's simply because I can. I don't have children um, and I have a very supportive family and fiance and friends, friends around me as well. I didn't have a job that I was going to lose and things like that. So I could now, not everyone has the ability to do the same thing as the next person, and we should never compare our abilities based on the person next to us because everyone has, firstly, different characteristics, but also different states in life, whether you're a mother or father or single, etc., means that you have maybe less or more time to devote to activism or, or volunteering and community activities, things like that. 
So the last thing we should do is compare ourselves to others, but just compare ourselves to the person we were yesterday. I have this uh, inspiration from, I would say from God, but not everyone here are, are believers, but I felt some sort of calling that COVID was my opportunity to stand up and speak for others. And it turns out I was right. Uh, I was looking for some sort of purpose for many, many years before that. And I, I, I endeavoured many things that failed um, before that. And then COVID happened and I thought, maybe I've learnt enough over the last four years of failing that I can actually use my voice in a in a proper way to connect with people. And that's what happens. So basically I'm only doing it because I can and you can do what you can do as well. So before I, uh, well, I will say obviously for the people who don't know that um, I have been on the front line of the, you know, the sort of push back against the, the the narrative and the government overreach um, since August 2020. And of course, I've suffered a lot personally. I've been uh, in uh, forced isolation in prison for 22 days. Uh, my Most of my family have left the state. Uh, my living conditions changed um, a lot during this time. Of course, I live with a, a certain amount of anxiety and fear, um, most like people out there as well. But, you know, I am in this till the end, um, no matter what happens. And I'm just so grateful to be able to share some light with some people and empower some people, even if I have to fake a smile sometimes, that's really important. So um, that's pretty much my story. That's why I'm here. Now, before I hand over to Liz, who's going to let you know uh, who our speakers are tonight, and we're just going to roll the videos and it's going to be great. I just want to let you know some housekeeping that we've turned off the chat functionality on Zoom because uh, many people gave us feedback that the chat was quite um, distracting. However, you can still write a question in the Q&A section. So at the bottom of your Zoom window, you'll see Q&A there and you can still ask us questions. And if you agree with someone else's question, you can actually upvote that question, which means that you also want to ask the same question. Then after the Zoom, we will get that information and we'll be able to address those questions. So I wanted to let you know that we are reading your feedback and we welcome your feedback. And I also, before I hand over, thank you to those people who did a live stream uh, on the Facebook page yesterday so that we could show other people. It's so inspiring that we are able to inspire others potentially or the group is able to inspire each other to start getting the the uh, empowerment to turn on your phone and do a live stream because it's that first live stream that's really, really hard and then it gets a lot easier. Trust me, I know. All right, Liz, uh, you know, let's introduce our guest tonight, please. Hello, everyone. It's um, fantastic to be here and to think of all the inquiring minds around Australia who are watching us and listening tonight. And we're really, uh, as Monica said, we're really interested in what you've got to say because it's, it's we, it's us, not I and you. Um, so tonight we do have a, uh, a really good lineup of speakers who will give you the benefit of first-hand political experience in Parliament. That's going to be very interesting. Um, on the ground politics and interfacing with journalism, uh, import and export. We've got some very interesting experience uh, perspectives that have um, that, that that we're drawing on. First up, we have uh, Morgan uh, Jonas and um, Morgan C. Jonas is what <laughs> I know him as, uh, you know, online all the time. So um, and he'll be covering addressing why we are not educated in preferential voting. An interesting question, that one. And we've asked Morgan because he, he brings rich experience um, from, he's a very sensible, ardent man, and I can say that I've never met him personally, actually, um, but I've watched him a lot of hours online, a lot over a lot of time, and uh, you know, he brings um, export, import, uh, you know, trading background, lots of uh, insights and perspective, much broader than many people who just live in Australia and, like, just live in one country. And he was speaking up against the Daniel Andrews regime long before COVID. Um, and, and because he ha is of that independent mind and that he's a very, very good person that we can listen to and draw from. And secondly, we have George Christensen, MP. Uh, what an honour to be able to listen to him, a man of great integrity. and. Um, uh, so he will be covering how major parties 
win in elections, perhaps keep winning, but how major parties win in elections and giving us a window into the next three years and and beyond if we don't do something now. Um, I'm suspecting that's going to be a real pencil and paper uh, little segment there. Um, and then thirdly, we've got Aidan McLinden, and it's wonderful to have Aidan too. And he's going to cover, or Aidan is actually started in politics as, as the youngest endorsed um, candidate uh, back in, at the age of 17, uh, youngest candidate, um, endorsed candidate in Australia's history. Um, that was some years ago now. And he created the Queensland Party, which eventually, which emerged into the, um, with the Catters uh, Australia Party cap. And then he became the national director of that. That was before. He's also worked in um, in city council and uh, education. So it's, it's quite very multifaceted. And uh, Aidan will be speaking on uh, the importance of valuing your vote. That's guarding it, making it valuable. So this education program is nonpartisan, um, and it's aimed at equipping voters to steward this individual and social responsibility that we have the privilege of with the, called the vote our vote with wisdom and discernment. And the project of saving our nation starts at the ballot box. So could we um, roll with Morgan now? Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Morgan C. Jonas here from MCJ Report. Welcome to Making Political History. And I am very happy to be here taking part in this course. So thank you to Monica and the team for putting this on and having me speak. Rightio, so the name of my segment tonight is Why Are We Uneducated Regarding Voting? That's right. Now, not everybody, okay, but a lot of us, absolutely, we are uneducated in the voting system. So put your hand up at home if uh, you, you've been a bit confused over the years about how it all works. Now, it's not your fault. It's actually not anybody's fault. I suspect it could have been done this way by design, maybe just maybe to benefit the major parties as in Labour and Liberal to ensure they keep getting voted in time and time again. But ladies and gentlemen, before we get into the nuts and bolts of this uh, particular uh, presentation, I'm going to create a little bit of context here regarding uh, Labour and Liberal and just show you a little bit of the beginning of this duopoly as we refer to it as the two-party system whereby uh, one election it's liberal the next it's labor and they just keep swapping back and forth alrighty so what do we have here labor and liberal have dominated since 1946 that's right that's a long time ladies and gentlemen so why do you think it is that between now and 1946 we have not had a government outside of a labor and liberal government all right so let's uh let's take a bit of a look here shall we uh, some uh, some beginnings here. All right, so I've got a timeline here. So there was a bit of a turning point. I'm going to take you back to uh, 1943 right here. So uh, you can see on my screen, we had a uh, Labour government and the next largest party, the United Australia Party, not to be confused with the United Australia Party of today, which is technically a different entity. All right, so 1943 Labour government and then in the next year something happened we have Labour and Liberal Liberal as the second largest party all right fast forward to uh, 1949 you've got a Liberal government so effectively from 1946 our governments have either been Labour or Liberal they just keep going back and forth so let's take a little bit of a look at uh, how this happened we've got this Liberal Party here 1946 seemingly popping up from uh, nowhere after the uh, shutting down of the former United Australia Party so let's take a look so what happened there how was it that UAP was replaced with the Liberal Party alrighty so we got the uh, original United Australia Party here founded 1931, dissolved in 1945. All right, just a couple of dot points. And if you'd like to look into the origins of these parties in more detail, we'll send you out the links that I've used in this presentation. All right, so it says here, after the 1934 election, the UAP entered into a coalition with the country party. Goes on to say the UAP ceased to exist as a parliamentary party in February 1945 when its members joined the new Liberal Party of Australia, all right? So in comes the new and improved Liberal Party. 
the contemporary UAP 2013 has no connection or relationship with the former party. Alrighty, so the Liberal Party comes into the scene, right, and uh, just trading places with Labour and Liberal over the years. So uh, it says here, the Liberals' immediate predecessor was the UAP. More broadly, the Liberal Party's ideological ancestry stretched back to the anti-Labour groupings in the first Commonwealth parliaments. The Commonwealth Liberal Party was a fusion of the free trade anti-socialist party and the protectionist party in 1909. Okay, so you've got these smaller parties dissolving. You've got former MPs defecting from their parties, creating this loose coalition, ends up becoming the Liberal Party. Fast forward to today, and that party is still standing today, very much of the time, of course, in a coalition with the National Party. All right, so that just gives you a little bit of a context. So the question is, why, since... 1943 has it only been labor or liberal how come no other parties have been able to rise up okay so that's a question that a lot of us might be asking and i'm going to attempt to at least somewhat try and uh cast some light on that tonight we can speculate of course now here's the bad news and i think a lot of people would agree with this statement and this is probably why you're watching this presentation tonight labor and liberal have destroyed Australia. So put your hand up if you agree with this statement. Now, I'd like to bet that you could walk around the street speaking to people and there would be a decent portion of the population who do not have faith in either party, yet are under the impression that voting for Labor or Liberal are their only choices. Now, why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? So now when I say that Labor and Liberal have destroyed Australia, I'd like to show you what I'm referring to. And you can tell me at home if you believe in these statements or if you don't. And have a think about whether or not you know friends who may agree with the following statements, yet may not be able to draw the link between uh, the statements and Labor and Liberal. All right, so check this out. Labor and Liberal have destroyed Australia. Here are 10 points. Now, there's a lot of other points, okay, but this is just for um, illustrative purposes here. Our manufacturing has been all but destroyed. That's right. We used to be a great manufacturing nation, and the joint policies of Labor and Liberal have undermined our industry over the years and shipped our workforce and industry overseas. Two, our fuel supply is limited and subject to global price fluctuations and manipulation. That's right. We used to be almost fuel independent here in Australia once upon a time, but of course, relying on these uh, overseas sources makes us uh, very vulnerable to price fluctuations, uh, vulnerable to the direction of fuel based on market speculators and so forth. All right, three, domestic and foreign policy has been outsourced to unelected bodies such as the United Nations. All right, now we would like to make our own policy here in Australia, but unfortunately that process is exported to these unelected uh, bodies overseas, the United Nations and other policy so-called think tanks such as the World Economic Forum hijacking our policy making process. Four, government has grown massive and is now involved in all aspects of our lives. That's right, two and a half million government workers, layers upon layers of bureaucracy and duplicate bureaucracy just uh, dominating our lives in so many different ways. You need a, a certificate for, th for this and a, a, a form for that, just regulation dominating the market. Five, taxation is too high and wasteful government spending is unchecked. You know, like $45 million a year on former prime ministers, that sort of thing, and, and MPs. All right, it goes on to say here, number six, corporate interests drive government policy. That's right. So we've got the lobbyists in Canberra, whether it be the pharmaceutical lobbyists or lobbyists from other industries, of course, in the ear of our elected representatives, uh, pushing them and prodding them to put forward certain policy. Not a very democratic process. I say that these uh, corporate interests have definitely played a role in destroying our country. Seven, former politicians receive huge lifetime pensions whilst millions of Australians are doing it tough, all right, just disgraceful. Eight, our ADF is understaffed, understaffed and under-equipped. Nine, human rights have been suspended surreptitiously under the guise of public health, and I know that you know what I'm talking about there. 10, politicians lie to get elected and are not held accountable. All right, so these 10 points right here, ladies and gentlemen, if you were to run through these points with your friends and family, maybe people who are not very politically engaged, what do you think their response would be? Surely at least some of those points they would agree with. And then you could ask them a question, who are you planning on voting for? They'll probably tell you Labour or Liberal, 
And you can come back at them and say, well, hey, actually, it's Labour and Liberal that are responsible for these uh, destructive attributes that are now commonplace in our country. And you can see what they say if you bring up that type of discussion uh, with them. Also, of course, uh, the mainstream media has not helped pushing along these big two major parties. So the question really is, how have they been able to get away with this? All right, we're talking about since the late 40s, just swapping chairs, Labour and Liberal, destroying our country, undermining our industry. Once upon a time, not all that long ago, it was very normal for an Australian family to be on one income only and to live a pretty decent life. Those days are long gone. I mean, think about education. If you, like me, I was, uh, I grew up in the 80s. I can tell you that growing up in primary school, our heads were not filled with these woke agendas that we see today. And I'd say that education was a lot more wholesome. Why are we going in the direction we're going in? The answer is always the same because the dominant political parties that have held power for too long now, they're destroying our country. All right, so how have they been able to get away with this? How? This is my opinion, my opinion alone. I don't claim to be correct, but I, I, have, I, th I think this is pretty accurate. Australians have been kept ignorant about voting and led to believe that their only options are Liberal and Labor and that voting for minors or independents is a waste of a vote. Who here has heard somebody say that before? Have you ever had a conversation with your family and friends? Hey, who are you voting for? Only to be met with, well, liberal, liberal or Labour. And you may respond something to the effect of, well, why don't you try a minor party or an independent? To which a common reply is, well, they don't get anywhere. They're not going to get in. So I may as well choose Labour or Liberal or the lesser of two evils. Okay, so this is probably the biggest lie that I would say has been permeated throughout our country for far too long now. The mainstream media, of course, is complicit in this lie, only giving real coverage to Labour and Liberal and therefore casting the impression throughout the public that these two big parties are the only two real options. And when I say Labour and Liberal, by default, I'm also including in that the Nationals and the Greens. All right, we also see our politicians, they make no effort at all to educate the public in regards to how to use our preferential votes so that we so that some portions of the population might be a bit more uh, forthcoming in voting for minor parties knowing that uh, ultimately their votes won't be wasted and worst case scenario they can go back to the evil they know no that's right the politicians wouldn't mention that our education system here in australia makes no effort to educate young children in regards to voting options and minor parties and independence and how the preferential voting system can be uh, utilized to potentially unseat Liberal and Labor. So I'd say that the political establishment in Australia, they've got it figured out pretty well. Keep Australians distracted with the mainstream media and AFL. Uh, make no mention of the preferential voting system and how regular citizens can utilize that voting system to actually uh, seek to make a change in Australia by voting in minor parties in independence. No, none of that. Keep Australians in the dark, uneducated, uh, drinking beer and voting the same creatures. All right, let's just call them creatures into office time and time again. All right, so here's the good news. Here's the good news. Voting for a minor or an independent is not a waste of your vote, not by any stretch of the imagination. And that is because we have what's called a preferential voting system. So let's take a little bit of a look here at how it works. All right, so uh, this is a sample here from the AEC website, a sample of a House of Representatives voting ballot paper. All right, really, really simple. Uh, you've got a number of boxes here. It could be could be six. It could be ten. It depends on how many candidates are running in your lower house region. The way to fill the paper out: number every box in sequential order, from order of who you would like to get elected. That's right. That's how preferential voting works. If you don't get your first pick, maybe you, you'll get your second. If not, maybe your third, fourth, fifth, and down the chain it goes. So when it comes to numbering the last boxes. My general advice would be to uh, put in very last position the most evil of evil in terms of how you see <laughs> how you see evil, and uh, work upwards from there. 
All right, now the Senate is a little bit different. You've got some options in terms of how you vote. All right, so we're looking at a sample uh, Senate paper right here. Now you see a big line going, uh, going through the paper. That's called the line. You hear this term time and time again, above the line and below the line. So if you're voting above the line, you're essentially voting for uh, parties and groups in terms of the order in which candidates have been numbered. Okay, so when it comes to the federal election, you've got the political parties putting up a group of senators to run. Senators are elected based on a percentage of the vote. Okay, so um, if you're voting above the line, you're essentially voting for parties and you're, you're voting for candidates in the sequence of which the party has allocated those candidates. So an example here, you've got a number one that for argument's sake could be the Liberal Democrats and underneath they'll have their one, two and three. So they'll have their David Limbrick in number one, I believe Crystal Mitchell in number two and whoever's their third in number three. You might put your number two here as say One Nation and again, they'll have their one, two, three and fourth uh, Senate candidate. Uh, and then number three above the line and along you go. Now the recommendation from, from the AEC is that when voting above the line, you vote six boxes, okay? Although uh, there's no harm in filling out every single box. In fact, I would say that's probably best practice. And it just means that there can't be any hokey pokey business after you've filled in your ballot paper. All right, and I also recommend that you use a pen. Now, I'm not saying that uh, there would be hokey pokey business, but what I am saying is in theory, there, there could be, okay? So we'd hate to see a situation where a ballot paper was manipulated. So for best practice, if you're voting above the line, I would vote using pen. And instead of numbering just six boxes, I would number every single box so that there's no possibility that a uh, surprise seven, eight, nine, ten 10 might show up on your ballot paper. Again, not saying that would happen, just saying in theory, it could happen, all right? So uh, AEC, don't shoot the messenger, just uh, not accusing you of anything, just saying that maybe there's some bad people out there that might seek to manipulate a ballot paper, right? So that's, that's voting above the line, okay? That's the most uh, common way of voting. Something else that I should mention, actually, before I move to below the line is, uh, you can vote for groups of independents above the line. That's right. So have a look at this paper right here. You see these first uh, few boxes here, these first six boxes, they've all got party names below the box. But then you'll notice this box here uh, the, that has been ticked as number four, which is the group G, has no name. All right, so what is this box right here? Well, this box is representative of a group of independents. So a group of independents that have formed an independent coalition are assigned a blank box above the line. All right, so let's just say that me running as an independent, I uh, recruit a fellow independent to run alongside with me, not as part of a party. We would be allocated a blank box above the line and below the line, you'd see two names. You'd see Morgan and then you'd see the number two uh, person in our group. I hope that makes sense. And uh, so the, essentially the purpose of having this uh, blank box is so that groups of independents can get above the line. But of course, they do not have the advantage of having a party name or any type of recognizable word next to the box. It's just a blank box. All right, so that's above the line voting. I hope that makes sense. So minimum one to six, but for best practice, use pen and fill out every single box. All righty, now, below the line, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard this term below the line. So above the line, you're voting for parties and the order of candidates uh, from those parties based on what the party has determined. And uh, below the line, you're voting for individuals. That's right. So the recommendation from the AEC is that you number 12 boxes below the line. But if you'd like to number every single box, then that is 100% your choice. Now, why might somebody choose to vote below the line? Well, the simple reason is Voting below the line gives the voter the, a greater capability to vote for individuals first and foremost, instead of voting for parties first and foremost. So uh, for example, you look to the right of the page here. These are where the independents are. So uh, this box here without a name next to it 
is a group of uh, independents who have formed a loose coalition. And now we look to the right of this blank box and we see uh, no box, but a word underneath a term ungrouped, which is for independents who do not have a running mate, okay? Now, the only way to vote for these independents who do not have a running mate is to vote below the line. Recommendation, recommendation is 12 boxes. So for argument's sake, you might vote for an ungrouped uh, independent as number one. You may go across the page and vote number two under Liberal Democrats. You might jump across to say one nation and put a three for one nation and along you go. So you have uh, essentially more control over the individual that you vote for when voting below the line and it gives the voter greater capability to, of course, make an informed decision based on the individual before making a decision primarily based on a political party. And let's face it, when it comes to politics, individuals matter. They matter more than parties, that's for sure, because it's individuals that can blow the whistle, that can stand up and do the right thing at the right time. Just look at Gerard Rennick, part of the Liberal Party, and I dare say that some of you watching tonight do not like the Liberal Party, but we sure as hell like Gerard Rennick because he's standing up and doing the right thing. He's a man very worthy of representing the people, I would say. That's just an example. So if Gerard Rennick was up for re-election in the Senate, you might find him below the line, even though I have my suspicions the Liberal Party will get rid of him. But that's another story. You'd find him, you'd find him below the line. You'd put a number one next to Gerard Rennick. And if you're a freedom person, you'd put a number two, say, below Liberal Democrats or One Nation and so forth. So I hope that makes sense. So if you're voting below the line, number one to 12 boxes, or you can fill in every single box if you like. Again, I say use pen because, uh, and if you make a mistake, just demand a new ballot paper. And that's how preferential voting works. So this whole misconception that somehow if you vote for a minor or an independent, you're wasting your vote, it is an absolute lie. Okay, you can simply put the major parties last and worst case scenario, hopefully you end up with the lesser of what you consider to be two evils. And that's simply how you vote. It's pretty, it's pretty simple. Uh, Topher did a great video explaining the mechanics of the preferential uh, system using marbles. I recommend you check that out. But for all intensive purposes, ladies and gentlemen, this is how you vote. And uh, I just want to add one last thing. I need to put one last thing in. When it comes to voting above the line and below the line, you can't do both. Choose one or the other, otherwise your vote will be rendered null and void. All right, so that's about it from me, ladies and gentlemen. I hope this was informative. Share it with your friends and family. Let's get these people out of parliament. Labor, liberal, they've gotten away with too much for too long. They're destroying our country. We must get them out. Let's get new life into parliament and let's take our country back. Thank you for listening. Morgan C. Jonas, MCJ Report, signing off. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Aidan McClendon, and I have had a previous career in politics uh, in local, state, and federal government over the past two decades. Now more than ever, we can see that Australia has got some serious problems in terms of our fundamental freedoms being compromised heavily, uh, and also the micromanaging of our lives and the intrusion of government policy. This is our chance to actually say, well, hang on, how can I do something about this? Rather than uh, just sit on the sideline or go to the protest, we need to do one step further. And that is to inform ourselves at the ballot box, who are we voting for and where are we gonna put our preferences? Preferences, as you should know, are simply the preferencing of one, two, three, four, five, six of the people that we see as the best to the ones that we would probably not want to represent us in there. Our votes are valuable. I can speak from my own personal experience when I ran for a council election of some 15,000 voters. It took about 12 days and two and actually three recounts to see who in fact um, the person was successful uh, as the candidate in that seat. In there, there was three of us in the, uh, in the race at that time, uh, back in 2004. And I only just got across the line by 74 votes. This was, mind you, after two or three recounts uh, and a, finding a pile of 50 votes on the, wrong, on the wrong candidate. So it was very, very close. 
What you need to understand is that you'll never know how close and how valuable your vote is going to be. Yes, we're annoyed, we're frustrated, we're battle weary from saying, well, what's the point of even voting? Um, you know, we're a big system where it's, you know, one of the duopoly or monopoly, as some would even call them, are uh, going to win, it's all stitched up. Well, it isn't, and the system is put in place that we can actually maximise good people into the parliament, into all levels of parliament, but particularly the federal election. Uh, this is our chance to really put a handbrake on some of the things that are happening, but also have a renewal process. What's, you know, some great policy that we can have and get some, um, you know, some competition of the, you know, great ideas into the parliament and people to be able to speak freely because even freedom of speech has been heavily compromised um, as we're going forward. How to vote cards uh, is such a critical thing for the major parties particularly because they want people to say, if you're going to support us, this is how you should vote. So they've already put millions and millions of dollars into it, put people on the booths to ensure that they can capture as many people going through, particularly the ill-informed, mind you. They might say, oh, well, I don't like the government of the day, so I'm going to vote for you know, the opposition, um, rather than actually looking at the options they've got on the field. So you need to make sure you equip yourself um, with an um, informed choice and to make sure that you vote according to your will, nobody else's, uh, because your vote can be maximised by making sure that those preferences uh, go through to the people that you would um, want to see into the parliament representing your needs and to make sure uh, that it is formal. So if you can cast a formal vote uh, and you can go and tell somebody else you know, about this important message, I mean, we can double those numbers overnight and then those people can tell those people. I mean, this is a grassroots campaign that can be from the bottom up. The more you can educate yourselves and others in ensuring that they are voting for people that best represent their views uh, and also ensuring that their preferences and where they decide that vote to go does in fact go somewhere uh, where they, they would prefer than otherwise, we can empower ourselves through this political process to ensure that good people get back into the parliament and we can get this country back on track. Good luck. Make sure your vote counts. Go and tell somebody else about this and make sure their vote counts. Whether it's your friend, send them a text. Whether it's your neighbour, have a chat. Ask them how they, if they know how the system works or who they think they should be in and why. Have those conversations because we're not going to change this from the top down. We will only change this from the bottom up. Let's get our country back on track. Good luck. Thanks for listening. Well, we're very lucky to be joined here today by George Christensen, who has been a member of federal parliament since 2010 with the Nationals Party, has uh, recently decided to uh, not continue in parliament. So I think it's a perfect time to talk to George about the inner workings of parliament so that we can uh, look out and make sure that we can make our vote count in the best way possible. So I'll just start off, George. People know who you are mostly anyway. So um, looking at how the major parties win elections and have for many decades, can you briefly describe to us what sort of money is funneled around lobbyist networks um, and independent outfits to influence the pre-selection process? Well, thanks very much, Monica. And before I do, can I congratulate Reignite Democracy Australia and yourself uh, on this excellent initiative, uh, educating voters uh, in this upcoming election is extremely important. But look, uh, You've asked uh, the golden question, pardon the pun. I mean, uh, yes, the reality is that there are um, uh, lots of connections uh, in terms of money between uh, lobbyists and political parties, uh, and some of it is done overtly, as in, um, say, for instance, Pfizer uh, makes donations to both the Labor and the Liberal parties uh, and then has its lobbying efforts uh, uh, overtly on the lobbyist register in the Australian Federal Parliament. So that's one way it can be done. Another way is it can be done through organisations. So instead of a company uh, directly lobbying, um, well, well, instead of a co company directly donating, they might donate to a third party organisation that supports uh, a, a particular political party in one way or another, either through... Uh, maybe direct contributions or maybe just through support of advertising and that sort of thing. Um, so, so there's a range of different ways that this goes on, but it does go on. That, that There's definitely the case that lobbyists are donating to political parties. Uh, I think that that is... Uh, I've got to tell you that, that my wish is that we would ban lobbyists from Parliament House. 
Um, I'm going to change the subject a little bit to um, the polling booths. Now, there's a lot of people in the audience are obviously going to be going to the polling booths to, um, you know, try to talk to voters and things like that in a really nice and unconfrontational unconf way. Uh, so if you had one key message or advice to give to someone who's eager to go to the polling booths as apolitical potentially, uh, what, what, would, what would your one piece of advice be? I think that you need to think of the issue that or, or the number of issues that you are most passionate about. I think that you need to think who is the best place to party or person to deal with that issue that's on your ballot paper. Um, put them number one, then think carefully about the number two spot. Uh, think carefully about the number three and so on and so on. But also as ultimately as you think carefully about the number one spot, think carefully about the party uh, or parties that are least likely to be the ones that, uh, that fix those issues or resolve those issues that you feel most passionate about. And they are the ones to come last. Um, so that, that's, that's how I would deal with this. Is there any um, sense in, you know, voting below the line and, and going 1 to 12? Like, does it make a difference? Like, if you were to give advice to your own friends and family, um, would you suggest that they vote more than 1 to 6? No, I'll be voting below the line in the Senate. Um, I'll be voting below the line. I'll be voting the full 12. Uh, and I won't be following what uh, a political party tells me to do there. I will be doing exactly that. I'll be putting number one, the person who I think um, is the most passionate defender of freedom uh, in the uh, in the Senate uh, or that, that could be there for the Senate, and I'll be going through. Now, luckily, that list of 12 is a bit different here from what I said before, what I was talking about before in terms of putting someone last. That's in the House of Representatives ballot in the Senate, number one to 12. You will put the 12 people who you would like to see in the Senate. Um, right. Now, uh, uh, so you wouldn't put anyone down that you don't that you don't like. You know, let, leave, if there's someone that you don't like, leave them off off your numbers yep. when it comes to the Senate paper. Yeah, and just to clarify for people in the lower house, the House of Representatives, you have to number every box, and that's why you have to choose who you like the least to go at the end. But in the Senate you can just leave them off altogether and not vote for them. Um, and I have heard that voting 1 to 12 is uh, it's more protective of your vote to make sure that it doesn't accidentally end up in the preferential system going with someone that you don't like. Is that a true statement? No, well, look, it ends up being your preferences, of course. Uh, and when you go do number 1 to 12, uh, you are actually choosing, uh, yeah, let's just say that that, you're not particularly enamoured with a particular political party, but you do like a particular senator or a candidate from that particular that, that political party. Well, you might decide that they're going to be part of your 12, but the others in the team aren't. So, so that's what this will enable you to do. It, it enables you to support the individual rather than support the party. Um, but there might be an entire party ticket that you're absolutely wrapped with well they can get your number one two mm. three four five and six vote if they have six candidates uh you know uh uh so, so it's it, it all becomes up to you then but I, I think that um you you really do with a with a one to twelve vote you probably will exhaust um or nearly exhaust the list of of people that you want uh on your ticket and you would like to see get elected and I think that that's the most important thing. Um, we need to make sure that, uh, for me, people that are pro-freedom are in the Senate. And uh, if I can vote for every single one of the pro-freedom people with that 1 to 12, uh, then that's doing the job that I need to do. Now, when voting below the line, which is what you're just talking about, it's uh, recommended you vote 1 to 12, but if there's only 11 candidates you like can you just vote one to 11 or do you have to put someone in that 12th position well look I, I i think you can but let me be clear here uh err always err on the side of the caution the australian electoral commission say this if you vote below the night the line you need to number at least 12 boxes 
from one to 12. So that's at least, so you can go more than 12, but the AEC actually on there is saying that you need to number at least 12 boxes. They're not actually telling me here that your vote would be invalid if you numbered less. So, but but I would err on the side of caution. If they're saying at least 12 boxes, number at least 12. Uh, that actually, it means that you can put more than 12 um, down if there are more than 12 freedom, pro-freedom candidates that you want to support. So for you, when you're voting, let's say you have a party that you like the most, but you mm -hmm. don't necessarily like the individual that is in the Senate number one position. But then mm -hmm. you have a second favourite party and you really like the candidate in the number one Senate position. What do you do? Do you vote for the individual or do you vote for the party? Um, I'm probably more inclined to vote for the individual, but it really probably... It, at the end of that, it, it's why do I dislike them or why do I like them? Um, mm. If I dislike them because they're probably not likely to follow the good things that I like about their party, then uh, that would probably be a reason not to be voting for them. Um, but if, uh, you know, so, so there's nuances there. Uh, I am always someone that... Um, probably follows the person more than the party, so to speak. Um, but obviously, uh, if, if you know, if it's someone, I'd, you know, like like I, I like Donald Trump, but there are a lot of people that didn't like Donald Trump, but, but they liked everything that he, uh, he stood for, it just didn't like his personality, so they voted for him anyway. Uh, I'm kind of like that too, that, uh, you know, like I couldn't care less about you, uh, you know, whether you pick your nose in public. Uh, it's... Um, you know, what do you actually stand for? What do you believe in? And what are you going to cast your vote for and against in the Senate? So, um, you know, uh, to answer the question in short, the person, the but person. not the personality, what the person believes. That is really good advice. I mean, I've thought about the conundrum that I would personally be in if someone like Gerard Rennick or Alex Antic or you um, were in my electorate but in a party that I have become disenfranchised from, you know, I would struggle not to vote for those people, even though I don't yeah. like the party. Um, you know, what would you say to that? Yeah, look, there probably would be uh, a few people, even if I run again, who would struggle to vote for me if I was uh, running in my seat with the LNP name beside I can understand that. Uh, all i got to say is that... Um, you know, I think that people like myself and Senator Antic and Senator Rennick and others have probably proven that you can uh, remain individual and, uh, and near independent in your thinking and your deliberations and your votes uh, and how you, can, how you conduct yourself in the parliament, uh, even when you're within a political party. It's very, very difficult to do. I mean, there's a lot of baggage that comes with it there's a lot of attacks and there's a lot of uh, ostracizing um but uh yet yet it can be done but uh that all depends on the individual and in theory this isn't more of a this isn't much of a question but it's kind of a statement that you could respond to but in theory if we got good individuals like jared rennick and alex antic into the liberal and national parties in theory they could change the party from within right in theory, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it uh, you know, w w will it uh, will it happen anytime soon? No, I'm just going to be clear about that. Um, that there is a war going on, particularly within the Liberal Party, where you've got this uh, uh, moderate wing and the the more conservative wing, and uh, even then, that doesn't uh, really touch on the issue that I know you and many of your listeners sort of have been passionate about, which is about all the freedoms that have been blown up because of COVID. Uh, you know, that sort of moderate versus um, uh, versus conservative uh, uh, factionalism, re really, it doesn't matter where you are on that spectrum when it comes to this. Uh, uh, there's been conservatives that have been wholly embracing of all of the pandemic insanity and uh, there's been moderates that have certainly been embracing of it as well. So uh, uh, it really is just going to come down to the individual and what they believe and how well they're going to hold themselves in Parliament. Now, I've been telling uh, the viewers uh, in our earlier programs and the lead up that we absolutely have a unique opportunity um, for, to get the uh, disenfranchised, say, major party voters um, 
into the fold of voting for freedom focused parties and preferencing correctly. And am I right to be hopeful in thinking that Australians are actually going to put a lot more effort into this election than any election ever potentially? Is that correct or am I being uh, naive? Well, I don't want to be too much of a crystal ball gazer here. I, I just um, think that that it is an important election um, that people have seen things over the last few years they never thought that they would see unfold in their country and that people are a little bit more politically astute. There are a lot of people who did not care at all about politics, uh, would probably run away from a political discussion. Um, and, and now they are very, very switched on politically uh, as a result of everything that's happened. So, um, but, I, but I, 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 look, I don't want to talk it up too much, Monica, and get people's hopes up that we're going to see a revolution and that we're going to change from the two-party paradigm in government through to we're going to have this um, sort of um, broad coalition of, of, of freedom parties sort of governing. Um, that would be a massive thing. I understand that we can't be too hopeful. We have to be realistic. It's it's not that possible to change the whole duopoly in one election. However, if we get a solid, freedom-friendly, freedom-focused voting bloc, we can mm -hmm. definitely make a huge impact. Is that at least a fair statement? Absolutely, absolutely. And that's that's what we've got to hope for. I mean, what, what, what we need particularly in the Senate, and, and, and this is why it also needs people within the Liberal National Coalition still there, still strong on these issues like Antic and Rennick and others, um, so that if bad laws come before the Senate, that Senate is like, you know, the proverbial um, boy with his finger in the damn wall, you know, stopping those bad laws from coming through and affecting you, me, our families, our communities and our country. That is has got to be the ultimate, um, yeah. and and I think that that's the strategy. Look, look if if there's a if there's a, a hung parliament in the House of Representatives, I will be surprised. Um, but there's possibility, and so there's also a possibility there that if there was, you know, if there was one or two seats in it, and there just happened to be one or two freedom parties that held a lower house seat. Um, well, you know, you could also see some something there. For those who don't know what a hung parliament is or what it means, can you briefly explain it? Yeah, so roughly to have an outright majority, you need about 77 uh, seats in the House of Representatives. It means your party needs to have won 77 electorates around Australia uh, and one of your members will go off and become the speaker, so that brings your numbers on the floor down to 76. That's a majority of one. Um, you could probably still effectively govern as a majority if you had 76 votes, but given that you only have 75, which is just, you know, 50-50, you're really, really cutting it fine. Um, anything less than 76, 75 uh, seats, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to be relying on someone else to always side with you in order to get legislation through, to get your budget through to also ensure that if there ever is a motion of no confidence, uh, that you have the numbers on the floor of parliament to withstand that motion of no confidence. So that's what a hung parliament is. A hung parliament's when you only have just, you don't, you, don't, you don't even have just enough to actually win those votes on your own. You have to rely on one, two, three, four, five, six others to uh, help you uh, always win votes in the house. So if we get a, a voting block of, you know, say seven or eight, maybe up to 10 freedom-focused candidates and parties, would that be called a hung parliament? If you got, uh, it, it, it all depends on whoever's in government uh, and however many seats they have in the parliament. If they have less than um, 75, uh, 76, 75, then yes, that pretty much is uh, a hung parliament. Yes, so I actually lived through one as a member of parliament back in uh, 2011. So I was elected in 2010, uh, actually it was 2010, 2011, 20, 
12 and uh, then that parliament finished in 2013. But uh, the government of the day was the Gillard Labor government and um, they were supported by two crossbenchers uh, who were both independents. And um, it, it was just, it, it, it was shocking to be quite honest because um, nobody knew what was happening from one day or the other. The two independents really were calling the shots most of the time. Uh, as were the Greens, uh, because they had uh, the balance of power in the Senate. And um, it was a government led by the nose rather than uh, a government that was actually doing things, um, which was bad for them. But I've got to tell you, um, I'd rather a government being led by, the no led by the nose by freedom parties than a government doing things which are going to hurt the Australian public. So uh, okay. there you go. So that's a very achievable thing. So we're going we're gonna to leave that topic on, on, that, on that note. It's happened before in the wrong direction probably, but this time we have a chance to make it happen in our favour for freedom-focused people. So we're going to focus on that. So to everyone out there, there is absolutely hope and it's not even that unachievable at all. So that's good. Now I'm just going to uh, change the topic a little bit to uh, in the next coming years, uh, obviously you are privy to the legislation that's in Parliament at the moment, all the things coming up. A lot of people are worried about digital ID. They're worried about um, the implications of Australia obviously being signed up with uh, the UN and the, the, the strong cities networks and also, also especially the uh, World Health Organization treaty that is supposed to be in effect in 2024. Um, so I know that's a really loaded question, but just just can you summarise the most worrying legislation that we need to keep an eye out for? Digital identity. I, I, I don't even need to think about that. That is the most worrying legislation I have seen. Uh, uh, I'm sort of, in one respect, thankful it doesn't come before the parliament that I'm part of. I'm also disappointed it hasn't because I would have uh, absolutely railed against it. Um, but uh, uh, that is uh, authoritarian. It is uh, an instrument of totalitarianism, and I don't say that lightly, Monica. Um, what we have here is legislation that essentially uh, captures us all, everything about us, uh, uploads us onto some cloud and lets government look at everything about us. Uh, I don't want that. Government knows enough about us already uh, without uh, going down this track. Uh, and really, there is not one person, and I said this in my final speech to the federal parliament, there is not one person who has stopped me in the street, called me, emailed me, come to my office, or, or communicated to me any other way saying that they want a national digital identity system in this country. There is not one person that's done that. And, and I, I would say that there wouldn't be one person uh, who's ever approached a member of parliament or senator about that in this country. But there is one person who's pushing it. His name is Klaus Schwab. And there is one outfit that's pushing it. Their name is the World Economic Forum. And, you know, uh, Australian democracy is such that it goes from the grassroots up, not the top down. So, you know, when legislation lands on the table like that, MPs and senators, good MPs and senators, should be asking, where did this come from? No one's ever stopped to ask me uh, to bring in a, a digital identity system. Who's pushing this? And, um, you know, if it's from the globalists, forget it. Uh, if it's from the public, consider it. Um, and this is something that's from the globalists. It's a threat to democracy. It really is for that one reason alone. The public have not asked for it. The globalists have asked for it. I, we shouldn't be doing this. Well, we, we didn't ask for a lot of things over the last two years. So um, now outside of Parliament, I can assume that you probably are going to be pretty vocal about the digital ID as soon as it comes close to voting on, being voted on and things like that. And, and you know, as the people watching and you and me will be really, really strong on this topic. So everyone just stay tuned for that because if George is the legislation, I, I, I believe him. Uh, so we'll, we'll keep, keep that in mind. Um, the last thing uh, I want to say is uh, if someone came up to you and said, ah, there's no point researching the minor parties or the candidates because the major parties always win anyway, so I'll just go on the day and just vote, you know, for the, the first person in a coloured T-shirt I see. Like, is there any point in people putting the extra effort in? 
And what would you say to them if you had 30 seconds to entice someone to think a bit more? What is the one thing that you would say to them? One thing I'd say to them is uh, look at the Senate. Uh, the Senate has always uh, dictated what laws are going to end up looking like. And uh, it's not the major parties that are doing the dictating. It's the minor parties. So they can be important. Don't write them off. That's awesome. And that's what we've been talking about this whole interview is that we can put basically a really great damage control into place. And that is the first step to, I think, you know, changing this country from within. So, um, George, is there anything else you'd like to say before you leave? There's probably a few thousand people watching. Is there anything you're leaving Parliament soon? Is there any lasting message you want to give to our audience? Well, I just hope that uh, everyone's going to, uh, you know, put put um, things aside that are secondary and just focus on the primary, this, uh, this vote. And the primary is all about freedom as far as I'm concerned. Doesn't matter if he likes the colour blue and that person likes the colour red or likes the colour green. Uh, that's all secondary stuff. Uh, doesn't matter what your views are on the Republic uh, or whatever. Maybe it does if that's your big thing. But, uh, you know, it doesn't matter your views on all these secondary issues. The issue is really uh, that, that, that's going to be at the forefront here is what is your view on freedom? What is your view on our right to privacy? Uh, what is your view on human rights? What is your view on these pandemic policies and the destruction that they have caused uh, to the public that has got to be the litmus test going into this election because if it's not i don't know what else is really i really don't know what what else you could be asking um yeah. uh, uh and 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 look you know uh thank you for that um glowing endorsement monica too that you've given me probably repeatedly over the course of this interview um I am certainly going to keep a blowtorch uh, to uh, the body politic in this country, the um, uh, the politicians, the political elite, and uh, and those through um, all of the uh, all of the platforms that I'm currently on. So uh, you know, people can still follow me there. Thank you, and obviously we'll be working together on that. And it's really important that we have someone like you with experience inside that house to know how to effectively. Um, lobby with our voice and things like that so um you know you are really powerful for our for the freedom movement i guess some people have referred to it as and i agree once we get our freedoms back we can start squabbling again but for now yeah. let's focus on uh getting our freedoms back so that we can squabble again <laughs> because without freedom you can't even argue so <laughs> anyway thanks so much george and uh you've, you've really added something special to this education program so and uh we'll, we'll be in touch soon thank you Thank you. Well, there you have it, guys. It's actually more simple than it seems. Um, all we need to do is get enough freedom-loving, freedom-focused candidates so that we can hold a balance of power. And even better, if the major parties can't get over 75 seats, then they actually won't have a uh, majority government anyway. So I, I, have, I saw quite a few questions coming through um, about, you know, oh, who are the candidates in my area? Who are the independents in my area, et cetera, et cetera. Don't worry. We have some amazing tools to share with you. And just after Liz's segment next, I'm actually going to show you the tools that we have. Of course, the tools are not finished yet because the election has not been called. So, of course, all the candidates have not been announced. So it's impossible for these tools to be uh, completely ready yet, but they are already in the works and you can already have a look at them. Um, now, in the in the in in all the rooms right now, we have over 1,300 people. And this is incredible because in the past, no one wanted to talk about politics at all. And if there's 1,300 people here, there'll be another few thousand watching the replays. So absolutely, we are creating a grassroots phenomenon uh, movement to actually affect change in the next election. So what can you do now? Well, as you can see, there's enough of you. And that's, that's number one. You're not alone. And what we are creating with this volunteer network that, that the Make Your Vote Count campaign is we are bringing people together to do actions to help change the election. Um, so you're going to make friends. You're going to make community. You're going to have fun doing it. We already have groups of people all around Australia going out to shopping malls and talking to people. And the response has been very positive, at least 
80% positive. Some people obviously don't have time to talk and things like that. But this is what you can do now. If you go to the Reignite Democracy Australia website and scroll down just a little bit under latest news, you'll see that you can volunteer there. You sign up and we get in touch with you and you can become a part of the solution. And the people out there are ready to hear what we have to say. People are sick of the majors, but they don't know if there's an alternative. They think, and, and I've done the survey on the streets myself, they think, well, what's the point? The, the majors are going to get in anyway. But we have shown with these interviews tonight, that absolutely, there is absolutely a point. So instead of sitting back and just hoping someone else does it, why don't you get involved? Even if it's just one day, trust me, it actually feels so good to do something that you think could make an impact. It makes you sleep better. It makes you wake up better. It makes you a happier person. It makes everyone around you happier. So just give it a shot. You can always stop doing it if you don't like it, but there's no harm in trying. So I, I'm going to I'm gonna put it back to um, Liz, but then after that, I'm going to give you guys a sneak peek of the tools and explain that you don't have to do all the research yourself. Others are already doing it for you. So Liz, if you want to go through the the homework, <laughs> and then I'll come back. Yeah, I will. Gee, that, that was really impressive um, listening to those three gentlemen. Uh, I, I was really attentive myself. So, um, you know, we've got some awesome people um, in our country now uh, who are speaking up. And you know what? It's, um, it's not your fault that we are here where we are, but it is or my fault. It's out, but it is our responsibility um, to get out of it. That, that's it. And I'm, I'm conscious that we've got, um, and, and it's a tragic thing. I, I almost don't like saying it, but I know there's about roughly 1.5 million people who are out of jobs, out of their careers. You know, and that, and um, because of you know things that have been put on them. You know, the medical mandates and that. And on day four. Um, just letting you know on day four, we're going to give you, you are going to have an opportunity and the rest of us are going to have an opportunity to channel that anger, disappointment and that incredible disillusion into something positive. Um, so tomorrow, tomorrow day three, what is on, just before we get to the favourite part, homework. <laughs> okay, um, tomorrow day three, uh, what we'll be covering is voting a, a voting wisdom workshop with um, the... Uh, now famous, um, been famous for a while, uh, Topher Field, uh, bringing his famous marbles um, and building on that video, building on that video. And, uh, you know, we set the homework um, last night to to watch the first marbles video. That was on the House of Representatives, uh, that one. And um, so number one, the, that workshop, the Voting Wisdom. Number two, we'll be covering, uh, we'll be extending that into practical application because what is important is that we can turn information into action. And um, and then the third, as Monica intimated, that um, we're introducing a brand new tool and uh, that comes with a website with resources, uh, very, very good resources, and um, uh, that will help you vote wisely in your electorate and, and to empower all your friends and family to help them really easy. It's quite, and it's fun, um, but to put the power into your vote. So our assignment is, you know, the assignment we have is to win this election, to, to at least at least a good voting block, you know, but to win the election in a way that we put the freedom force forward, um, to get it out of the hands of the self-serving politicians and the internationalist or globalist interests and back into those who will govern uh, and in the way that reflects our values. And um, so it's kind of like, let's get civic. <laughs> um, so if you will rep uh, invite one person Per day, if each of us will invite one person per day, for, it's roughly forty days till the election, and we'll invite one person per day to, um, uh, uh, well, we'll talk to talk to one person per day to, uh, you know, tell them, you know, help them, uh, you know, help them with this information that you're learning. Just one, that'll be forty people uh, bef you know, before the election. By the time the election comes, and then if you know, and if you ask them to do the same thing. Then you know the second person, you know, it, they will also have thirty nine, and then the, you know, and it will just absolutely explode and across the spectrum of Australia. Um, so that in that way, it's doable. Um, 
So, uh, and, and as Monica said at the beginning, I just wanted to remind everybody that your questions, we are taking no careful note of your questions so that we can um, answer them through the sessions or directly if they need uh, separate handling. Um, now your homework, preparation for uh, tomorrow, which is day three. Um, uh, well, we're going to go ask you to go, for those of you in the Facebook uh, group, to go live there. We saw a couple of really good um, live, um, we just call them lives there. And um, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's, here's our screen here. So what you do is you go down there and, okay, so the screen you're seeing is some of the people that, um, there. Now, Okay, it's just going a little bit fast for me, but can we just take that a little, little back, back a little bit? Yeah, thank you. So in, in your news feed, you can see live video and, and you just click that there and that's how you post this, how you start the process to go go live and and there's just you just sort of follow the clicks then and we're probably not going to go live. <laughs> that wouldn't be good, uh, but that, that helps you do that. And you know what? I've been really... Um, I've been, oh, what are you going live about, is explain what you have learnt so far that you didn't already know. So we've covered some really interesting stuff tonight. It was pretty, there was a lot of information there. So what did you learn, to, what have you learnt so far that you didn't already know? And I've been really, um, really impressed and gratified to actually get emails from people because not everyone is in the Facebook group. Uh, we've got about 5,000 people in the Facebook group and 7,000 people signed up. That, so it's about 12,000 people all up. But those who aren't with the Facebook group, um, you know, there, there were some emails come in and said, look, I'm not in Facebook and that, but this is what I would say. And I just I just thought that was awesome because that's, you know, that kind of initiative is what it's going to take us forward, that kind of initiative. It's really cool. So, um Monica, I'm going to turn back to you uh, to finish off the night. Thank you. So, you know, with the live videos that we showed you at the start and also, um, you know, the, the 7,000 email subscribers, we are actually creating a community and the program only started yesterday. So just imagine we have 5,000 people in the private group right now. Imagine by the time the election comes, how many people are going to be in there if we keep inviting our friends. I've seen some people inviting 20, 50 people who all accepted the request. So I think it's going to balloon quite a lot and we'll have to be careful with the content to make sure that Facebook doesn't notice it um, because uh, you, you know how Facebook is but we're going to keep it alive as much as possible and of course this page can be used for the state elections coming up as well so you're not joining a group that's just going to die um, it's going to live on past the federal election and so are the volunteer group networks and things like that so this is really really exciting um, yesterday was really quite an introductory uh, show and today we just we smacked you with some information, even myself as well, watching all that, like Liz said. So anyway, I'm wrapping it up, but what I want to wrap it up with is talk about the tools. So uh, Studio, if you can show the website on the RDA page. So um, basically, we're putting together this website, which is going to have just a lot of information, and we're obviously going to build on it as we go. So I'll just wait for it to start scrolling down a bit. So obviously, I'm promoting the education program, which will be taken away once it's done. Learn more about preferential voting. You've got an example ballot paper there. Um, you could also uh, volunteer on that page as well. But underneath that is really where the magic is going to happen. So RDA has sent out a really comprehensive survey to um, hundreds of candidates so far, and we're going to make sure every candidate has an uh, opportunity to fill it out. And actually, the results of that survey is going to be produced here. So you will actually be able to type in your electorate and see exactly which candidates have filled in the survey and you will be able to read all about them. We have asked all the curly questions, trust, trust me, immigration, euthanasia, abortion, climate change, education, housing, um, you know, just every, everything. Uh, connections with uh, the, the World Health Organization, there's just so much in that survey. So you're going to really get to know your candidates. So that is one tool for people who want to read and really learn more about their candidates. The other tool is um, actually we have him on tomorrow night. It's called Majors Last. Now, the website isn't ready because, of course, like I said, the candidates haven't been announced yet. But this website, you're actually going to be able to put in your electorate and answer a few simple questions and it will actually spit out a how to vote card that will uh, value your values the most and make your vote count and you'll be able to share that with as many people as possible. So RDA is really pleased to be able to um, help 
you know, promote that tool because in conjunction with my, uh, with, with the survey that's really quite um, in depth, and then with this easy tool, together with those two things, guys, you are going to have everything you need. And on the RDA website, there's going to be links to to all of the candidates' social medias. They also have a special little paragraph to uh, promote themselves and even a video if they've decided to send it in. So really, it will take you a few hours to really go through all that content and you will absolutely know and feel confident to make your vote count and even endeavour below the line and go 1 to 12 if you feel so inclined to because you're going to have the information. So for all the people asking, and I have been reading the comments, but who are we going to vote for or how do I know who's in my electorate or how do... It's all coming. It's all coming. So just make sure you're signed up to either the RDA subscription list or the uh, Making Political History, and we'll make sure both databases get that information. So on that note, uh, we're going to finish off with a, a little promo video that Major's last uh, is, is doing, which is that other uh, tool that I told you about. So this is just a little promo video, but tomorrow, in tomorrow's session, you're going to learn a lot more about how that website works and how they're actually are going to produce the How to Vote cards. But, you know, guys, I mean, we <laughs> we absolutely can do this. I, I've, I've never been so excited about an election. And I've never been so excited to be sitting uh, at my computer staring at my camera, but I know that you're all there behind the screen, um, you know, hopefully uh, enjoying yourselves. So I'll finish now. Please cue the promo video studio and we'll see you guys tomorrow night. Please do your live streams on the Facebook page. I'd love to see what you learnt so that we can uh, maybe expand on that. You could even put in, you know, what you want to learn that you haven't already if you like to. So I'll see you guys tomorrow.